And hello, everybody. I am Jim Freund and producer, curator of the New York Review of Science Fiction Readings. With us, uh, Barbara Krasnoff is engineering, and Amy Goldschlager is up in the air trying to get the heck out of Florida and probably just can't do that fast enough, but she'll be with us in the future. This is the first reading of our 31st season, believe it or not. Uh, between Claire Wolf, Gordon Van Gelder, and I, we've tried to figure out, is it the 29th or the 30th? So it's either the 30th or the 31st, one way or the other, cause for celebration. Uh, coming up next month, first Tuesday of next month, will be Jason Eric Lundberg talking to us from Singapore. Uh, so while it will be 7 p.m. here in New York, it will be 7 a.m. in Singapore. So as er uh, Jason likes to say, uh, I am talking to you from the future. And then the month after that, huh, November. Uh, who is our November reading? Barbara, do you... Amy is hosting it. Okay, well, uh, uh, but it's a great one. And, and, and it's somebody that both she and I uh, picked up on, so it was great. And December, our usual family fest with uh, Carlos Hernandez and CSE Cooney, Claire Cooney. Claire is also going to be reading at KGB in November, but those are going to be very different types of events. Okay, now for the first time on the New York Review of Science Fiction readings, although uh, not my first time interviewing him, is, well, simply one of the great writers in the science fiction. And uh, that is Michael Bishop. And uh, we can bring him on any time. It takes a little while for these things. Hello, Michael. Hello, Jim. How are you? I, I'm I'm doing fine. I I don't feel prepared. I don't. I should have like a bibliography in front of me, but I don't feel That's quite all that, right. <laughs> that I always need one. Also, it's funny when I look at Wikipedia to look at the bio that they gave you. Um, they didn't list some of my favorite books. Hmm. Like Philip K. Dick is dead, alas. Really? I, the last time I was there, I think uh, that my friend Michael Hutchins contributed to that particular piece, and he wrote. I, I think I have a. I had at one point maybe a bigger uh, uh, Wikipedia entry than James Joyce, if that sounds possible. But but uh, maybe they thought that was ridiculous and cut it back. I had nothing to do with that, but my friend Michael Hutchins may have. Okay. And, uh, well. I was grateful to him. <laughs> either, I, either Michael Hutchins will go in there, possibly me, and we will append these. Uh, but uh, uh, they mention your award-winning stories, which mm -hmm. there are quite a few. And uh, th there are, uh, what, nine novels at this point? I'm not exactly sure. I, I would have to stop. But as far as publication goes, I've, I've had uh, well over 30, you know, book length publications. Some of those have been books I've edited. Some of them have been story collections. Uh, I would say it's 35, 36 or so. Wow. I, how, uh, how many languages? Uh, I've been published in a number of different languages, uh, Japanese, uh, uh, Spanish, Italian. German, um, I'm trying to think, French. In fact, uh, Unicorn Mountain, which came out in a new edition last year, a revised edition, has been sold to a French pub publisher uh, in, in, its, in its new version. And it should come out probably either later this year or next year. Cool. Okay, that's good to know. And I have a feeling it's going to be published by one of the people that you don't see just logged in, but I did. 
Uh, let me tell you that Patrick Swanson says hi. Oh, well, good. I'm glad he's out there. And his, and, and his name will be uh, coming up because you've been working with him for about the last 10 years. That's right. I, I think that our association, I know we knew each other before we started working together uh, as publisher and, and, uh, and writer. Uh, but I know that in 2011, I think we were talking about things that we could do. And in 2012, uh, our first book together was a republication of, uh, um, let me see, I've got it here. That's one of those a republication books. of Brittle Innings. Yeah, I love it. Uh, hold, hold that closer to the camera. I, and, uh, I don't bring know which way little. to go. I keep going right, the wrong right. way. Uh, go up. <laughs> uh, uh, higher. Higher. Bring, uh, now to, well, I don't know. My left, your right. Yeah. There we there go. There we go. There we go. Okay. Um, and okay, before we get into discussing the current book, which is uh, much of the reason for this session, I did want to ask you an important question about brittle innings, because right. I, I, ha I have a thing for fantasy and science fiction and baseball. And my question and we don't want to do any reveals here. My question is simply, why is it that baseball is such a great venue for, or rather science fiction and fantasy is such a great venue for baseball? You don't get that many uh, football stories. There's the occasional one or two. Certainly no badminton whatsoever. But there's just something about baseball that beckons the fantastic. Well, I think it may be in part uh, just the stadiums, the arenas in which uh, baseball is played. Uh, they themselves uh, are, can have a kind of enchanted quality, I think, and sometimes even a haunted quality, depending upon uh, where you're going with the story. Uh, but I also think it may have something to do with the game itself, because the game itself uh, really has no time limits. It has innings that ha must be finished or completed, but it has no time limits. And so conceivably, uh, uh, a game could go on for decades, you know, without ending. And I think, who, who was it who wrote uh, Shoeless Joe or the... Uh, W.P. Kinsella. Right, yes. Who also well, wrote the Iowa Baseball absolutely. Confederacy. confederacy. I'm, I'm blanking on one word. They're turning Shoeless Joe Robert Field of Dreams right, into right. a TV series, which I'm not thrilled about. But the Iowa Baseball Confederacy, mm -hmm. that would make a great ongoing series. Well, and I think if you're an American, you know, and you're a writer, you, you always think about, well, I want to write the great American novel. <laughs> and I know Philip Roth called one of his novels the great American novel, and it was about baseball. And it was very funny. Uh, I don't think anybody agreed that it was his best novel, much less the great American novel. But it certainly resonated with a lot of people, I think, simply because uh, baseball was once considered at least the national pastime. Now I believe that football and, and uh, uh, has kind of taken over. In that's, that regard. that's just a viewership. And as far as Congress is concerned, yeah. for what they're worth, uh, it is still baseball is the is the official American sport. Right. And anyway, I, I do feel that you know the individual players on the field stand out so that you can see them one by one as they're on the field. But at the same time you recognize that they're operating as a team, working together. But there is a moment for each one of those players to shine. And because of that, there's also a chance for uh, us to think about the individuality of that player. We want to know their backstories in some cases. Uh, and I think that uh, writers are drawn to that. Uh, I know I am. Of course, yeah, I'm, a big base, I'm a big baseball fan. Uh, and uh, as, uh, as was I before all the strikes right. about 20 years ago. I'm but, a New Yorker. I grew up in the shadow of Shea Stadium in the New York Mets. So uh, Very close to the New York Giants and the Brooklyn Dodgers at Ebbets Field. Well, now I live not far from Ebbets Field. Yeah. In Brooklyn. But... but uh, 
uh, well, that's Flatbush, but I could walk to Shea Stadium where the Mets played. Mm -hmm. And I and I did go to the Polo Grounds for one Giants game, but <laughs> uh, I really don't remember it that well. But I'd rather talk about your new book. Okay, great. I'm sure that Patrick feels the same way. Um, uh, with two people, we can't insert the cover, can we, Barbara? I don't think you can insert it. You can join it. Well, there oh, it is. It's just go. a little crushed. A few last words for the late immortals. I would like to mention that uh, I'm, I feel indebted to both Patrick Swenson and a longtime friend and collaborator of mine, Michael Hutchins. I asked Michael if he would edit the book. He put together my bibliography, and he was good enough to go in and look at my shorter stories because I said I didn't want to do any story that was longer than 3,000 words. As a matter of fact, if it happened to be longer than 3,000 words and I thought it would belonged in the book, uh, I made a special effort to uh, uh, go into each story and see what I could cut so that I got down to the bare bones of the story themselves without losing, I think, either substance or, or atmosphere. And so all of the stories have been revised for the book. Uh, also, it consists of uh, about 15 or 16. It, there are about 15 or 16 poems in the book as well. And they are, are of course, short. Uh, so it, it's a it's a book of all my shorter pieces, most of all of my shorter pieces. I can't say all of them because we did do a, uh, a selection of those stories, the things that we felt would go together uh, uh, most congenially. And uh, I, I'm very grateful to Michael uh, for his work on uh, pulling those stories together. I know where they were published and in what year they were published and who the editor was largely because Michael uh, followed, uh, has followed my career from almost the very beginning and, uh -huh. done, and doing a terrific job of compiling a bibliography and making sure that I know where I publish my own stories. And like Patrick Swenson, he is watching this as well. So. Yeah, and Patrick Swenson deserves an enormous amount of support, I mean, uh, of, of credit, I should say, uh, because he has given me all the support that he has. Uh, we've done, this book marks the 13th that we've done together, and next year we're going to do a 40th anniversary edition of No Enemy But Time, which I, will, oh. which I have revised and I think uh, made tighter and stronger. Uh, and I'm not sure that any mainstream publisher uh, in New York or wherever would have would have gone for it. But Patrick has been supportive of everything that I've done there. And I think he's done beautiful editions of, of the individual books as well. They are gorgeous. They are. Yeah. Now, did you want to go straight into reading a short story? Because uh, we want to keep this to about an hour. Uh, although it's not that long a story. It's under three. It's not that it's long. under 3,000 words. I think it'd probably take me, you know, seven or eight minutes to read it. Maybe a little bit longer. But I, I read relatively quickly. That, and, uh, um, rule number one. Yeah, I, I would like slow. to read it. I would like to read not the title story, but the last story in the book. It's called Yahweh's Hour, and it's really a complete uh, re-envisioning of a story that I published in Omni uh, back in the 1980s with Ellen Datlow, um, a much shorter story that had some of, some of the same elements. But you will be able to tell after you've heard it uh, that it could not have been written back in the 1980s. You will recognize features of the story that only could have been written uh, here in the 21st century. Uh, and I I'm going to point out that it consists of passages in Roman type interleaved with passages in italic type. The Roman passages, which I will identify because I can't do it with my voice as, as I go into them, uh, are supposedly taking place in the main character's present. The italicized passages are either uh, the, the scenes that these characters are witnessing during this program called Yahweh's Hour, God's Hour, uh, and they are supposedly coming from the mind of the creator, but the creator in this case is not necessarily divine. 
Uh, so that's all I'm going to say about it, except to, to add that it's kind of a science fantasy with a, uh, with a satirical political dimension. And uh, with that said, I'm happy to read it. Great. All right. Let me put on my glasses so I can see what I'm doing. Yahweh's Hour. This opens in, in Roman type with a character whose name is Mercer, and that's all you will know him by. Mercer always showed up at the Dad Tower and Lodge to watch Yahweh's Hour. In these patchwork states of America, Overman Troy B. Dad's Evangels had chosen the Flam Channel to air the show. Watching it at 8 p.m. on Thursday was mandatory for almost everyone, especially ex-cons, so it always had a 100% rating for its time slot. Every other network went off the air. At the Grand Ballroom's door, Mercer received his sized low-blink crown, fitted it to his head, and elbows in, headed with other attendees towards the huge screen at the far end of the room. Many tables had filled, but midway in, a jaundiced-looking man yielded his place, which Mercer took. Then Mercer petitioned a weary-looking Chicano server for a beer and eyed with distaste the glowing screen. I hate TV, said a burly man next to him. I dig ditches before I watch most of the crap they shovel, but I love this show. Wouldn't miss it for a scrub in the tub with First Lady Alaya. If you miss it. Mercer said, you die. Well, there's that, but thanks to Overman Troy's sponsorship, I can hardly wait for my weekly 60-minute God fix. 40 minutes tops, Mercer's, Mercer's disgusted look slapped the man dumb. Three years back, after the first season of Yahweh's Hour, replaced each summer by reruns of So You Want to Be, a, be Filthy Rich, Every penitentiary in the land had released on Overman Dad's pardon any prisoner who had slain an enemy of the state, which was how Mercer had escaped the life sentence for beating to death a godless transgender teen ten years before Dad's ascension to the Overmanery. Mercer had been glad to walk free, but unlike the clod next to him, he loathed Yahweh's hour. All he ever recalled of it later was its ads for Discount Dad Care, Troy Dad University, Dadalac Escapade Limos, and Overman Troy's Casinos and Spas. These roughly five-minute ads came at ten-minute intervals after each god torrent, phosphorus dot hurricanes of mind-fogging vagueness. During them, attendees supposedly drank glory from God's aura. No one knew just what these storms embodied, though, because conscious memory faded and recording or trying to record a God spot was their potent. Thursday's time, time slot worked for the show, said Overman Dad and his suck-ups, because more viewers stayed home on Thursdays than on weekends, and God had no desire to hack off pastors, priests, rabbis, or any other regime-certified clergy who passed collection plates Thursday through Sunday. The Flam Channel's animated devil cherub danced. An ad for discount dad care broke open Mercer's musings, and when the de devil angel next jigged, a hard, flat glow from the screen frosted eyeballs and slowed brains. Like everyone else there, Mercer, Mercer succumbed. An italic passage. In this first blitz, he felt tied to the deity, raged against the, the tie, and endured a host of imposed emotions. Surely only milk toasts and madmen sought a mind melt with God. As an inmate on a prison yard seeking to skip a Yahweh's hour, an entire season ahead of Dad's controversial amnesty, he had a vision of hell that spoke to his adolescent art anarchism. Dad is God. God as dad, smoke everywhere. Dad is to God as Muhammad is to Allah. After that, he never avoided the sh he, he never avoided the show again. You got one chance. If you tried for two, you triggered a stroke and slept with worms. God is love, Mercer consoled himself, still awash in roiling mother of pearl images. 
If that was so, why did everyone else about him submit to this irreligious crapola? Yes, you had to watch. No, hallucinate these segments. But who other than God decreed that you must yield your entire being to these blurry spiritual fugues? By this belated point, though, even quasi-stemmed, Mercer had begun to frame an answer. He's coming out of this God spot back into the our, our current time. A dad university spot started and ran, and as captives around him semi awoke, Mercer bolted upright and pondered. Then, as the ad faded to black, a god lit Nova flung everyone back into stupefaction, all but Mercer, who blinked the starburst away and edged toward Epiphany. Since the first season of Yahweh's Hour, Overman Dad's assets had quadrupled. His pals had prospered, and his self-aggrandizing agenda had taken root. But some of his pardoned followers had genuinely recanted their crimes and asked forgiveness. In its phosphor dot storm, Yahweh's hour was now disclosing that this development greatly irked Overman Dad, even though his rarely consulted deity approved it. Back to italics. Through a storm dispelling lens, Mercer looked down upon his victim in a highway overpass outside Tyre, Georgia, beholding the kid's battered skull, skull and a face war painted with congealing blood. And this act, which had divine, defined Mercer for the country, but which had charmed the sensibilities of Troy B. Dad, he'd now regretted. Once he'd seen the weight at his feet as vile human waste as Overman Dad still did deserving of no send-off nobler than that of flushing dung down a toilet. And Dad had pardoned him for the glory of God and also for that of Dad himself, with whom the latter motor, motive held the higher priority, a fact often celebrated by his disciples or his children, as Dad called them. A third commercial spot kicked the crowd out of its hallucinations into more activity than it had shown emerging from earlier God fits, perhaps because ads of, of Dadillac escapades toting revelers over the Golden Gate Bridge through New York's Chinatown or along the Blue Ridge Parkway stirred everyone's blood. A buzz arose, bowls of cashews landed in front of patrons, beers were sipped, and the doofus beside Mercer raised his hands evangelically. Hallelujah, he cried. Mercer turned to him. Okay, what did you see? Still groggy, the man replied, Maybe my ship's coming in. How about you? Nothing like. Then you just ain't seeing things right. The devil cherub icon pranced about the high screen, an alarm buzz, and beers and tapas vanished from white cloaked tables as the night's third deific eruption flowed like lava over every chained mine. Indeed, Mercer saw fires like those that had beset every forest in the northern hemisphere last summer, swirling through the ballroom, as well as through the smoky grottos of his own cranium. Under the overpass outside Tyre, Mercer's avatar knelt beside his victim's long-dead doppelganger and touched its shiny face. Wrong pronoun, wrong place, wrong time. Wait. The pronoun might be wrong, but not the place or time, which were right for what Mercer was doing. For in this place and time, an atoning harmony held sway. But if he dallied, the flames all about Tyre and environs would overwhelm and, and incinerate the kid in him, like ants in a fire pit. Mercer spoke an apology, scooped the broken body into his arms and lurched toward the roadway. Harmony, he thought, but no hope. Headlights brighter than the scary all-embracing glow bored through smoke and flames toward them from the south. A limousine, a white limousine bearing down, scattering as it came the polluted atmosphere around it. The vehicle halted beside Mercer and his victim, ticking, a hot hunk of metal shedding heat through quick contractions and expansions. It had no saintly white-clad driver to welcome and usher them aboard but two of its passenger side doors opened out like unfolding wings 
and Mercer placed his mutilated victim on a seat behind the leather bench seat and slid in next to the empty place where a spectral chauffeur should have sat. And off they sped anyway to escape the surrounding devastation. God's firestorm faded to black as a commercial spot for Overman Troy's casinos and spas shook everyone awake for more flash rowdyism and some low blink adjustments before the last quasi quarter of Yahweh's hour. But Mercer couldn't move. He hunched on his chair just as he had perched in a battle act escapade in the vengeful fires of the Overman's impersonations of an entity that dad essayed distortedly to ape. Was it better for you that time? The doofus beside him asked. Yes. How so? The other guy took a gulp of his youngling. I shaped some of its content myself. Eyes wide, the man frowned. That ain't kosher. You got to go with the flow. Mercer shut his eyes and waited for the spot to fade, which it did quickly, as usual. And after an indoor sheet lightning flash, the musty ballroom's watchers again fell under the spell of, well, what exactly? In Mercer's case, not the megalomaniac sponsor of Yahweh's hour, but the wounded saint within himself. The limo ferried his victim and him through fire after fire, across continent to a locale in the Pacific Northwest where the kid had grown up differently. It finally stopped at an upland cabin by a cordwood stack where a man in a watch cap, dungarees, and worn sandals looked up as if at an alien visitation. Mercer swoop, scooped the nameless kid from the limo, let both doors close automatically, and walked with the kid's body toward the scowling man. The limo eased away into some scraggly, re-emerging evergreens. What in hell you want? The man approached. And who in hell's that? Your daughter. Mercer knew in his gut that the child had purposely morphed from boy to girl, but the man stared at the ruined being a while, then glanced in outrage between the body and the interloper holding it. The hell it is, Sambo. That's our boy, Garrett. If you brought him back for us to bury, you're out of luck. We got shut of him long ago. I'm here to confess. I killed her. Him, not her, the man insisted. Why in holy hell would you do that? I served time for doing it, but overman Troy pardoned me, and I, then God's grace on him and cold ashes on you. Mercer narrowed his eyes. Get gone and take that mangled piece of crap with you. Mercer lifted the young woman higher in supplication, but her father, scoffing, limped away up toward his family's cabin. Stunned, Mercer lifted the young woman, and whatever truer name she called herself in life, higher, and her body arose from his hands in a chimerical ascension. Romans. Yahweh's hour concluded with no heartening closing, closing music, and the highest rated human program in the patchwork states of America came on immediately after, a show about bad cops retraining as horse whisperers. Most attendees stalked back through the ballroom, yielded their low blink crowns, and filtered into the winter darkness. Mercer also stood to go. No cozy glow suffused him. His flat was blocks away, and tomorrow, if the trackers of the endless plague approved the overman's return to work order, which they would, he'd return to work as a foam extrusion operator for a dad-owned insulation firm. Leaving the ballroom, the ex-con had sat next to Mercer, bumped him. Hey, my bad. You forgive me? Mercer said nothing. Wasn't tonight Yahweh's our great real marching music? The best episode in this ever-loving series so far. Give me a break. Easy. Didn't your own smart-ass dream-shaping work, dream work for you? Mercer took the man by his shirt front, twisted it, then stopped, and in sudden liberating amaze, released him. Yeah, jerk bro, maybe it did. 
and skipped twice before settling into his usual punk-ridden trudge back to his flat. That's it. Anybody there? <laughs> One. It takes a moment for me to come back in. It gives me a, uh, a countdown after that. So uh, just imagine lots of applause and happiness. I, I have no idea. Coming from, oh, yeah, absolutely. I, I, as I said, I read the story this afternoon, and I, uh, I, I, I loved it, and I love it even more now. Um, let me ask a question that I am sure is very, very off base, but Mercer, the name of the character, that, that, that have any significance for you? Um, well, there's a Mercer University quite close to us in Macon, Georgia, and I think about it upon occasion. I also think of the, the word mercy, uh, and, uh. No. I was thinking something far more devious. Far more is, what? Far more devious. Devious? Yes, which is to say, let's see, did I put, oh, you see, I, 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 um, the microphone is on the other ear, as it were. All right, good. I hear you better now. Oh, okay, very good. Yes, uh, Mercer is the name of the character, the Sisyphus-like character in Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep? who's always pushing the rock up the hill and people can help him or throw things at him. And the religion in that novel is mercerism. You know, that's funny because I've read everything by Philip K. Dick and that novel is one of my favorites. Uh, uh, the Android's Dream of Electric Sheep, uh, Blade Runner. Uh, but uh, I could not have told you that there was a character named Mercer in it or, or a religion named Mercer called Mercerism without uh, going back and looking at it. Yeah, maybe, it got, maybe it got lodged in there uh, in my subconscious. I, I was just wondering because, of course, I remembered that, that wonderful uh, title, which I brought up earlier, Philip K. Dick is Dead. Right. When right. did you write this story? When did I write this story? Yeah. I wrote the original story. Let me see if I can find. I had a note here on that. Um, I've got all my pages turned around now because I've flipped them. Here it is. I put it over here so I could find it. And so, of course, I didn't find it. Yeah, it's uh, not worse than me. I published a short story called God's Hour in the June issue uh, 1987 of Omni. Uh, it was edited by Ellen Datlow, and she had asked several writers for uh, to submit short, short science fiction tales on a religious topic or theme. And I wrote God's Hour based on that. But it did not have the character Mercer in it. It did not have uh, uh, Overman Dad as a part of the script in any way, shape, or form. And what happened was that... Uh, I wrote this story before uh, the 2020 presidential election and revised it eight days after yeah. the attack on the United States Capitol on January 6th wow. of, of this year. So I consider it a brand new story and I consider it a response to uh, one of the most wretched presidents we've ever had. Now, considering that you live in what most people would call a red state, being Georgia. Uh, it's turned blue this year, and as soon as it did, the state legislature began making laws to make it harder for people of color to vote. Yeah, yeah, and they'll probably try to follow... What Texas Indeed, the Republican Party all across the country has jumped to do that on the basis of Trump's lie that uh, uh, he did not win the election because it was rigged. The only way it was rigged is that people went out and voted against him in great numbers. And the Republican Party didn't like that. And so we're seeing all that we are now seeing. Yeah. And I'm sure I'm offending some people as I say these things, but I'm really tired of it. 
I was, I was wondering about your neighbors. How do they react to you, you do, uh, or, or are they with you politically? I will say this, that uh, the conservative, my conservative friends here are conservative politically, but I do have some friends locally who are supportive of uh, what I see as uh, policies of inclusion rather than of exclusion. And on my street, we had more uh, Biden-Harris signs than there were Trump-Pence signs, although one neighbor did have a flag, a Trump flag, hanging from their front door. Uh, so, you know, things have changed here a little bit, but if you get out into the country, most people are, uh, are conservative and they feel like Trump whom I don't consider to be conservative, liberal. Uh, well, I don't think he has a political philosophy except Trumpism. Exactly, exactly. He's too much like a Heinlein character in that respect. Uh, he's a parody of himself. Yeah, it's true. Uh, if, if only it had stayed a parody. Uh, how much do politics enter your stories? I know religion does. What would you say your stories consist of? Usually my stories are about people who are in conflict with various aspects of themselves or their neighbors. And, and uh, if they have a science fiction ele element, I try to work out those conflicts within the context of that science fiction element, whatever it happens to be. And I try to be as faithful to human nature as I possibly can. Uh, and, and the way I, I interact with my friends, my neighbors, um, uh, other people. Uh, and I, believe me, I do not enjoy conflict personally. And uh, uh, I find it very distressing uh, that we have had in power for four years a man who seems to... Uh, um, magnify himself in terms of conflicts and to and to encourage conflict. Uh, so that's been one thing that I think has hurt our country a great deal. But it started long before Trump came into office. Uh, and I think that this politiz politization of, of even things like, you know, whether you should get a, a, a shot that's going to save you from the coronavirus or not are, are absurd. Uh, I'm just amazed that we have people who are acting as if uh, it, it's uh, that is even a their personal freedom to wear a mask or to take a shot. And yeah. that's why this is lasting as long as it has and why it's likely to last longer and maybe many, many years into the future, if we have many years into the future to go. Yeah. Uh, let me just tell the audience, by the way, that if you have questions or comments that you would like to pose to Michael Bishop, please, please do so. Um, you can use the chat box, whether you are on YouTube or Facebook, since we are simulcasting. And uh, we'd be very happy to hear from you. We're, get, we're getting a few comments from people, but, you know, some of it is like, I went to a Yankees game next, last week and... Uh, <laughs> Uh, uh, and Bill Shun, himself a fine writer, was uh, remembering God's hour. Oh, well, I, I, I know Bill, and hello to Bill, as a matter of fact. Yeah. Also, by the way, I mentioned earlier Jason Eric Lundberg. Yes, he's a friend of ours, and he was a good friend of our, our late son, Jamie. Yeah. And, and so we treasure his friendship for, for, for that very reason. Yeah, he, he, he's an, uh, uh, he was an, no, Jamie was an artist, right? And he did artwork for Jason, right? Yes, he did some, um, uh, he did some artwork for a, for a small booklet of stories of, of, of Jason's, I, I believe. Uh, I've got it somewhere here in the house. I'd have to look hard. This house is so big and we've got books all over it. We'll have Jason show it next month. When, yeah. Uh, when anyway, he comes I, I'm glad to know he's he's on. Yeah. Uh, uh, and and uh, let's leave it that way as long as he's in uh, 
Singapore, because they've been having tough times after uh, all of a sudden. Um, one person asks, does Michael attend many author and reader events and has he missed them during isolation? Well, I've missed them during isolation and, and I've had some health issues from, from about 2000 on. And that's made it kind of difficult to do some of the things that I'd like to do. The, the funny thing about it is that I feel like I'm in, you know, pretty darn good health, but I've got an issue or two that uh, tells me that that is not the case. And I'm constantly at the doctors or, or undergoing MRIs or receiving immunotherapy infusions and uh, uh, they're keeping me alive i think yeah in many respects and so i'm grateful to them but uh, it makes it a little bit harder to to plan to travel uh, and especially to go long long distances so uh that has something to do with it but i will say i wasn't a great uh, or a a what a frequent convention goer, even in my youth as a writer. I went to conventions, but uh, I didn't go uh, every month as some of my friends did. Um, one of our uh, neighbors from Canada says that you said that you avoid personal conflict. Is your fiction the place where you work out conflict? I think it is to some extent. You know, I, I think about uh, a unicorn novel. A unicorn novel, Unicorn Mountain, the novel that I revised last year. There's one scene, long scene, in which one, two, main, two of the main characters, a young man with AIDS, and a young woman who has gone all the way to uh, Atlanta from her home in Colorado to bring him back and to take care of him, uh, even though she's not a, a, a blood relative, but instead a kin through marriage, uh, and they work out. Uh, uh, their their feelings in this in this travel this this long travel sequence and the conflicts between them were one of the most important things to me about the book uh there's there are other things involved including real uniforms that real unicorns that show up on a ranch in colorado where this young woman lives right yeah, maybe i better get my mouth together here. <laughs> um, I might one i've of been the, trying to for years, oh, I haven't done it yet. I might mention that one of the uh, side effects of the medications that I'm taking is a dry mouse, mouth, a dry mouse. Yeah, there we go. A dry mouse. That would that would be bad. Dry mouth. <laughs> no, there are solutions for dry mouse. Uh -uh. Uh. Uh, okay, Brett Cox, also a favorite writer, writes. I know uh, Brett well. and Jeannie. Yeah. Yes, Jeannie uh, and actually, it's posted by Jeannie. But it says That's great. from Brett, and it says, uh, Mike, could you talk about the experience of revisiting and revising earlier work? Is the work still familiar to us, or do you think, how did I write that? I will admit that sometimes I look back on things that I've written, and I wonder where I managed to come up with whatever it was I came up with. I mean, and I'm really uh, kind of surprised by it. I, I can also admit that there are times when I look back at it and wonder why in the world I came up with that because it's not working so well. And that's one of the reasons that I go back and, and revise. Another is that I, I, um, I want the, each story and each novel that is out there to be the best version of itself that it can possibly be. Mm -hmm. uh, I've wanted that from the beginning, but I think I've learned a few things over the course of my career that allows me to look at these things in retrospect uh, with more objectivity than I had as a young man who thought some of my stuff was brilliant when perhaps it wasn't, when I know it wasn't now. Uh, and, I, and I'm still that way. I mean, I still can write something that I find to be uh, really not very good at all you know and i'm and i'm grateful that uh that i don't send or i've sent it out to some people that i trust who have looked at it and told me you know this isn't working very well or maybe you should do this or maybe you should stick it in a drawer and uh, <laughs> well nevertheless uh, bill shun asks uh seems like a good related question um it seems like your production as a writer hasn't slowed down much 
has that helped you through your health issues? I think my writing new material has slowed down quite a bit, and I regret that. Uh, but I also think that being able to go back and to look at some of these older works and do things to them that I felt should have been done originally, uh, it keeps me in the game. You know, I have to admit it keeps me in the game. I'm looking forward to writing new material. Don't get me wrong, but I will admit it is very, it, it's harder for me than it used to be. Like I say, the only story I have written this year, short story that I have written this year is the one I just read. And I wrote it very early in the year. In fact, you could say that I wrote it uh, toward the end of 2020 and, uh, and did not find a form for it that I liked until uh, early in Jan January. Uh, and I have not written another work of fiction since. I've thought of a few things, but uh, I haven't done that. One of the things I have done is kind of chronicle my, my, uh, my uh, interactions with people who were taking care of me. I, I call it my cancer diary, and I have published episodes of it on, on Facebook, and people yeah, seem to emails. appreciate it. Yeah. Uh, but I'll have to admit that that in many ways is, uh, is me trying to process what I'm going through. And it's not really helping me in my fiction writing, although I can imagine that it might down the line if I can get past this and, and feel like I have the time to do what I need to do. Right. And Bill also says, speaking of revising, were you unhappy with No Enemy But Mine or other works at that time? I was pretty happy with No Enemy But Time when I finished it, and I was for a long while. I was and happy there, when I finished reading it. Yeah. I mean, uh, there there are some things in it that that needed to be uh, changed, and I I I, uh, I, I should admit that I, I asked a, a friend of mine, uh, Gregory Feely, to take a look at it, and he gave me some good advice about the book uh, that I don't think changed the the book, except to knock out some things that people in on a second reading might not even notice. Uh, but I think he, I think he helped me improve the book. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm still, I'm still thinking about the punctuation in it. One of the things that I sought to do in, in uh, Unicorn Mountain was to uh, cut back on the number of commas. You know, they look kind of Victorian after a while, and uh, I like to see the, the prose flow without the commas. But if you don't do it the right way, you can confuse your reader horribly. Uh, so uh, I, I worry about that a little bit because I'm pretty traditional, originally at least, with, with punctuation and that sort of thing. After all, I'm, a, I'm an English teacher or was an English teacher. Yeah, and uh, Patrick Swenson points out it did win the Nebula Award after all. Points out what? I'm sorry. It won the Nebula. Oh, yes. It did win the that little thing, you know. I, I'm really kind of proud of that because if you look at the books that were up against it that year they they included books by robert a heinlein uh brian aldous uh uh let me see uh philip k dick and i'm trying to think regine wool wow tough field yeah that tough was a tough field. field and i i didn't imagine i had a, any chance whatsoever of winning uh, and whether my book deserved it against all of those books uh, i'm not going to think about too hard all he can say is it was in great company. Yeah. I, and, then, I, and then it won. Your peers right. liked it. Uh, one last well, that's the last nebula I've ever won. Oh, dear. That's <laughs> that, <laughs> so that wasn't the kibosh. But uh, more productive times may be ahead. I, I noticed a very curious thing talk, talking with writers about the pandemic, you would think, oh, this is a time that people could sit back and be more productive. But in fact, many writers have said, no, not at all. They've actually slowed down as a result. Yeah. Well, this is one year where social distancing and mask wearing and medical appointments was, uh, well, last year and, and even this one have been uh, major parts of, of my wife, Jerry's, and my lifestyle. And I have to give her a lot of credit, too, uh, for hanging with me in the way that she has and taking care of me in the way that she has. I, I, I love I, the photos of the two of you. Yeah, well, 
I love her. Uh, and you know, I, I see all of these things going up and down the the right side of the screen, and I would like to answer some of the questions, but I must admit, go it's for it, go for it. it. It's very difficult for me to focus on them and uh, to to, uh, well, to respond to your questions at the same time. So I thank you for asking a couple of the questions from that list. Yeah, I, I actually I think that I've uh, asked all but one. Uh, okay. Would, and that one is from Jim Ryan, who writes, of all the works you have revised, which one needed the most work when you updated it? Uh, question. I think the one that I, I cut back the most and, and enjoyed working on the most was one of my favorite books, but I think it needed the work that I did to it, and that's Unicorn Mountain. Uh, um, I mean, I was proud of it to begin with, but in going back and looking at it, I realized that there were lots of things I could do that would make it flow uh, for the reader uh, and would cut out some uh, repetitive stuff that it contained. Um, and I cut it by 15 to 20,000 words, which is, one, which is one reason, but I added some material too. And again, I had help with on that novel from, from Greg Field. Feely as well. I should mention that. Uh, but I've gotten, you know, a lot of help from from many people. I hope I've mentioned several of them here this evening. Uh, and uh, I'm trying to think of what else that I've revised. Some sometimes it's been my short stories. The short stories in this particular collection, a few last words for the late immortals. There are three, four, five stories in it that I think are better. In, in this book than they were in their original place of publication. Wow. And, okay. and if it's been a long time since you've read them, you may not recognize what's happened. Uh, but uh, one of them, like uh, in Rubble Pleading, about a young boy who's sitting in a barber shop in, in, uh, in a small town in Kansas, uh, and it's about a tornado that is hit, and some of the things that a man who has gone to that, sit, that little town that was wiped out comes back and talks about. I cut over a thousand words out of what was already a very short story, and I think it reads much better than it did before. Mm. And I wrote that story as a very, very young man, and Edward L. Furman was good enough to publish it in fantasy and science fiction. But I, I'm kind of surprised now, looking at it, that he didn't ask me for some edits, and he didn't. Mm. <laughs> well, different editors, different ways, I guess. A absolutely. Do you revise your poetry? Uh, I have, yeah. I have revised poetry. And uh, I do have a brand new poem in the book from this year. Uh, it's called The Scaffold. And it's kind of a response to uh, Dylan Thomas's poem, uh, uh, A Refusal to Mourn the Death by Fire of a Child in London. And it's about the Blitz in, in England during World War II. And I wrote my thesis in college on the poetry of Dylan Thomas, and when I was asked to contribute to uh, a Dylan Thomas Day Festival of Poets uh, uh, by a, a young woman who lives in Mauritania uh, and who knows Rees Hughes, I think he put me in contact with her, I, I was anxious to write something, and I wrote a poem uh, that uh, engages with that Dylan Thomas poem. And I worked on it pretty hard, and I, I had a couple of people looking at it. Again, Greg Feely was one of them, and uh, uh, I was ultimately glad with the with the final revision I came up with for it. Now uh, we had. Uh, I'll, I'll just tell a quick anecdote. Uh, I of course work at WBAI, and for a number of years, BAI was located in the Garment District on 505 8th Avenue. And there were these different illustrations in glass uh, around hallways and stuff that looked somewhat familiar. And somebody said, oh yes, this used to be Cadman Records, that's C-A-E-D-M-A-N. And I'm pointing at the main studio and I'm saying, are you telling me that's where they recorded under Milkwood? And they're saying, yep right there so yeah well the dylan thomas day that is is celebrated is the day that they produced i, I did a reading 
of uh, under Milkwood at a theater, a small theater, 92 Y Street, something like that, or that was the number of the theater in New York City. It might have been the 92nd Street Y where they do a lot that's of, it. That's it. A lot of literary that's it. events. Anyway, that was to honor the fact that uh, on the date that they had set aside for that, that was the date on which the reading was done at that theater. Yeah, well, we, we, we got the space where it was recorded, so there. Uh, I know the Cadman records. I was introduced to them when I was a high school student in Spain by uh, uh, two of the faculty members at our dependent high school there. And I'm, I feel grateful to them for introducing me to his poetry because I went on to write my master's thesis about it. Yeah, Cadman did a lot of wonderful work before there were audiobooks. Right. And before Baird Searles was at WBAI producing folks like Samuel R. Delaney and Joanna Russ and so forth. Uh, Cadman Records and Argo Records are really the, the only two games in town. And uh, I still have some of those. So... Uh, right. Well, I was, I was very heavily influenced by going to the apartment of this couple in downtown Seville. They were, they were married couple who taught at the dependent school in uh, outside of Sevilla, where where uh, we lived in town, my my family lived right in Sevilla. But every during the school year, I traveled to Santa Clara, this little enclave outside of town, where they have a school and housing for some of the American service personnel. But they had their apartment in town as well, and I remember going to their apartment and listening to Dylan Thomas on a record player they had there, and, and, and that voice he had a great, oh, yeah, great voice, wonderful. It just blew me away. And I was, I, I, at that age, I wanted to write, and uh, my my ambitions were huge. <laughs> uh, have you ever thought of writing for audio as he did? Well, I, you know, I, I've sometimes wondered why I haven't had a single book of mine, you know, done as an audio book, and I haven't, not a single one. I, I, I will tell you this: that I went to uh, Athens, Georgia, and. Uh, uh, they have a recordings for the blind studio there, and I recorded a good deal of uh, Count Geiger's blues there for them. And uh, um, they liked my voice and the way that uh, I had read it, but I've never, I've never had a, a commercial uh, version of any of my books as an audio book. Well, it's not a secret, uh, not that you probably knew it, that I work with an audio book company. Uh -huh. I, I'm an audio, I edit, I don't produce. I actually uh -huh. produce one, but I edit audiobooks. So, What's uh, and of people that are so ambitious that they did an audiobook of Dahlgren by Delaney. So, wow. Yeah, can you imagine? I, well, that's something. Yeah, and they did a good job. So, um, I'll shoot them an email. With, okay. your, with your email address. Um, did you want to read a poem before we left, or do you want to start signing? Well, it's been about an hour. Do you think we should? Uh, it's up to you. It? It's, it's totally up to you. Uh, well, I can read this fairly quickly, and I'll do it because I think it's a, it's a science fiction poem, and uh, it was also selected for a couple of best of the year anthologies, which is rather unusual for a science fiction poem. So I'll read this. It's called Secrets of the Alien Reliquary. And it's kind of a, a, a quasi military communication from a, uh, from a team of explorers on an alien world. And I've always had great fun reading it aloud. Uh, so let me do that. At first, we grossly failed to recognize it, assuming the displays in the camouflage temple relics of their espionage, dandruff from our anxious ids, the gleanings of a xenophilic curator with eclectic taste or no taste to speak of, an otherworldly magpie of the inconsequentia and splendor of our species, a devourer of it all. Later, we came to understand that we had stumbled not into a conventional museum, but a kind of backdoor, backdoor body house repository of fetishistic and thus shameful alien delights. 
not one arising from their own ferrograminous biology, but rather from a low percentile, albeit planet-wide deviant preoccupation, generally discreetly suppressed with anything and everything human. Stunned doesn't begin to describe our mindset passing among the temple's dioramas and interactive icons, which range from the size of fingernails, indeed one was a fingernail, to that of an immense holographic projection of a membrane-enveloped gallbladder, conspicuously diseased, which revolved aloft like a lopsided glitter ball in a clandestine discotheque. Who would have imagined that a silhouette of Abe Vigoda, a pair of gutta purchase galoshes, the scent of halitosis disseminated via an atomizer, a pictorial chiropractic text, a large petri dish of toenail fungus, a video of, ter of a Tourette syndrome sufferer, or a quaint electronic coupon for a box of hemorrhoid suppositories would have so reliably tweaked the private orgiastic impulses of some of these creatures that they would showcase their favorite libidinous stimuli in a concealed exhibition hall within an energy field only a click from our landing site. Among sentients, it appears, a pornographic yen is an infallible index, a potential pacifying bond that we should perhaps explore. Meanwhile, turnabout being fair play, several of us begin to find the jut of a benevolent femoral spur, the lemonish fragrance of a ruptured ovipositor, or even a coated swarm of their gill-dwelling symbiotic vermin, almost as arousing as venereal human contact or state-of-the-art handheld weapons of irresistible concupiscent destruction. What this bodes for in human interspecies relations, I am loath to speculate. Their reliquary, though, rewards a look-see. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, that was wonderful. That was just wonderful. The reading well, and, anyway. and the poem. Oh, I love it. It's, uh, uh, you know, good old style, fun, fun. Uh, the son of Ferlin Getty kind of poetry with science fiction thrown in to, uh, to just make it good. We're seeing uh, on our... Uh, uh, public column there, all kinds of people applauding, and uh, uh, I will add that as well. So once again, uh, the title of the book, Barbara, can we get that up on the screen, even if uh, it's thirds? A last few words. A few for last later. Words. A few last words. You see, I'm just, you know, Reversing them all for the late immortals. It's a great title. Several Michael people. Hutchins pointed out to me that we were trying to come up with a title for for the whole book, and that that was the best best one right there. Uh, so, uh, I, and I've always liked that title. That's the first story I ever sold to Analog, too. By the way, really? Yes. Okay. Well. Uh, what can I say other than I want to do this with you again soon, if not this, uh, an episode of Hour of the Wolf? Well, thank you so much for asking me to be on. I, I appreciate it. I, I, I really enjoy the opportunity to uh, read and to uh, talk to people. And I'm so glad to see some of the names I see up at the right there. That's yes. great. And, thank you all. And Thank special you. thanks uh, among those names to Patrick Swenson and Michael Hutchins. Yeah. Who, uh, Thank you all so much. Okay. So and thank you, too, Jim. Okay. Thank you, Michael. Good night. Good night. Good night. And a couple of final words to our audience that next month on the first Tuesday of the month, uh, will be Jason Eric Lundberg, who, uh, as was pointed out, worked with Jamie Bishop. So, you know, again, it's one of those small, small worlds. Uh, these events are not free for us to produce. We have to pay for the software and stuff like that. As you can tell, this is very different from Zoom. So, uh, 
doesn't cost us a great deal, but you know, any donation, any tip that you care to make would be highly appreciated. So with that, thank you, Barbara Krasnoff for engineering. And uh, I think I will be hosting the one with Jason. Okay, and, and uh, oh, and then in November, Nicole Glover will be our guest and Amy Goldschlager is going to host that. And then Carlos Fernandez and Claire Cooney on our December family special and Barbara Krasnoff will be hosting that. So once again, thank you, Michael Bishop. And I assume everybody out there is getting not one, but two or three copies of the book. We're not that far away from the holidays. So have a good night. And